The audience is filing in, and when the chairs are ready, you may begin the meeting. Well, I think we're ready to begin now. It's 101. Uh, this is Jay Frickberg. I'm the new chair uh, for the CS Bars. So welcome everyone. Uh, I will now turn over to Professor Kenyon uh, so we can do our joint welcome. Thank you, Dean Frickberg. I'm Devin Kenyon from Santa Clara uh, University School of Law. I'm the chair this year of the Law School Council. Um, and uh, sort of, we will keep the introduction brief by just sort of saying, and I feel comfortable speaking on behalf of the good Dean that we're excited to see everyone um, and sort of have a fruitful conversation today. Uh, we, uh, why don't we just jump in and have uh, bar staff take roll so we can get started with the business. Um, with the CS bars role, um, Jay Frickberg. Present. Michael Clancy. Present. Linda Keller. Here. Uh, Paul Kramer. Present. Greg Murphy. I'm present. Jessica Park. Here. George Liu. Present. So we have a quorum for the CS bars. Now I'll go over law school council. Devin Kenyon. Present. Susan Bakshan. Present. Nydia Duenas. Present. Christopher Ide Don. Present. Jennifer Mnukin. Grace Hum. Present. Don Smith. Present. And we have a quorum for law school council. Great, thank you. Uh, we've also been asked just to sort of recognize our newer members. Uh, I am pleased to be stepping forward as chair this year. Um, and I want to welcome our new member, Grace Hum, who was one of my professors in law school many, many years ago. So I'm glad to sort of see and welcome Dean Hum to the law school council. Thanks. Good to see you, Devin. Good to see you too. And I'll hand it over to Dean Frickberg to welcome his new members. Thank you. Uh, and again, this is my first meeting as chair. Unfortunately, I missed our last one uh, due to illness. Uh, I want to definitely recognize our new members to the CS bars. We have Dean Leal and Dean Keller. Uh, I think they'll bring a very interesting nuanced view to our discussions. Uh, I really anticipate and look forward to. Uh, I would also like to remind everyone, uh, again, of the history of the CS bars. Again, we've had a very cordial, collaborative, and contributive manner with the committee bar examiners, and that our purpose is to advise the CS bars. And to that degree, I think we did an excellent job under the leadership of Jackie Gardena, our former chair, who is now sitting on the Blue Ribbon Commission and specific to bringing our, our four pillars of consumer protection and transparency in alignment with the state bar, uh, student success, I think an alignment we have with all of higher education, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the legal education, which I think is one of the, the primary focuses of our accredited and registered schools in California, and preparation for licensure, uh, which again, I think is, is a good nod towards education not being solely for the purpose of a degree, but rather for the practice, the practice of law and helping our communities ultimately. So again, thank you. Uh, with that, again, I'll turn back over to Professor Kenyon. Thank you, Dean. Uh, I, I will sort of share similarly, the, the Law School Council has been a wonderful opportunity to sort of hear from bar staff to provide feedback. Um, and we are sort of excited to continue those conversations. We are also excited that one of our members, Professor Faction, is on the Blue Ribbon Commission as well. Um, and we're very excited to sort of see what happens with that work and how it continues and, and what the future of bar admission looks like in the state. Uh, as we sort of head into the rest of the agenda, I will make one note as sort of obligatory as someone who has to teach on Zoom with some regularity, just encourage everyone to please keep themselves muted until you're called upon by whichever of us is doing that. Uh, please use the raised hand function if you want to be identified and uh, you know, things will run very smoothly today. 
Moving forward with our agenda, I'm going to open it up for public comment. I will reserve the right to limit the duration of any public comment uh, just to keep the meeting moving forward. Uh, staff will do the identifying of the sort of speakers and will uh, sort of help us keep things flowing. I also want to thank uh, or acknowledge the fact that the uh, both the committee and the council have received written comment prior to this meeting around the issue of the online bar exam, uh, which we have sort of read and sort of considered. So with that, I will hand it off to bar staff to sort of identify people for public comment. Chair Kenyon, we have one commenter and I'll ask Raquel to um, unmute uh, Ms. Maria Tai. Good afternoon, members of the council and the committee. NCBE announced on June 1st that all February 2012 bar exams will be offered in person only. I've written to employ you to keep open the option of taking the bar exam online. While NCBE determines that in-person is the best method to administer the bar exam, its mission is to eliminate any aspects of its exams that could contribute to performance disparities among different groups. I would like to draw your attention especially to the needs of LM students and foreign attorneys a minority group of international examinees who tend to be non-US citizens. Notwithstanding travel restrictions vary across countries, the additional costs of testing and quarantining are tremendously high. Many non-US countries require mandatory quarantining of two to three weeks at a designated hotel after international traveling. Overseas examinees need to fly in a week earlier to adjust to the time zone. US embassies and consulates are experiencing a backlog of visa applications. Citizens of some countries, despite in possession of a valid visa, got refused entry at the U.S. ports due to political tensions. Even going through international traveling would not guarantee a sitting in the U.S., and we are speaking of the cost of one month for hotel accommodation, plus for tickets, plus visa application fees, plus COVID testing fees. If in-person is chosen as the best method to avoid cheating, there are other ways to carry out in-person assessments locally in foreign countries like how the NPRE have been administered in September. Having found the best method does not have to mean taking away the other options. One of the blessings of the pandemic is the chance to rethink the existing model of things. As the results of online exams are recognizable, why do we have to keep it as a backup only? The goal of diversity and inclusion in the context of a bar exam is to yield a wider access to the professional system. Being able to participate is the first step to get included. Therefore, I implore you to keep open the option of taking the bar exam online. Thank you. We thank Ms. Tai for her comment. Uh, we'll take it under advisement. Is there any other public comment? I know, Mr. Chair. Okay, public comment is now closed. I'll hand it off to Dean Frickberg. Thank you. Um, I would ask now our members of the CS bars. If they haven't already, if you could please review the minutes of our last meeting on October 13th. Unfortunately, I was not present, so I'll have to abstain in the vote on those minutes. Is there any discussion necessary in its review? Hearing none, I would ask for a roll call vote, please, for the adoption of the minutes. Staff from the bar to do a roll call, please, on adoption of the minutes for the CS Bar's October 13th meeting. Okay. Thank you. So, do I wait for somebody to make a motion? Is there a motion? I'll make that motion. I've read the minutes. I move to accept them. Second. I can second. We now moved and seconded. Do we have the staff do a roll call vote, please? So, Jay Frickberg? Abstain. Michael Clancy? Aye. Thunder Keller? Aye. Paul Kramer? Aye. Greg Murphy? I abstain for the reason I was not present. 
Jessica Park? Aye. George Liu? Aye. So the motion has passed. Thank you. Now again, turn over to Professor Kinney. Thank you. We will now consider approval of the minutes from the law school council meeting of August 18th. Uh, do I have a, a motion from someone on the council to approve the minutes? So moved. Thank you, Don Smythe. Do I have a second? Uh, second. Great, thank you, Chris Gita. Don, uh, I'll ask uh, bar staff to do a roll call vote. Devin Kenyon? Uh, uh, yay. Susan Bakshian? I'm staying, I wasn't present. Nydia Duenas? Uh, approved. Christopher Idedon? Approved. Jennifer Mnuchin? Grace Hum? Abstain, I wasn't present. Don Smith? Approved. The motion has passed. Thank you. We will move on to staff reports now. Dean Frickberg, I think you're the first one facilitating the first item. Yes, so I'll introduce uh, Natalie Leonard for staff on a report on implementation of accredited law school rules. Uh, thank you, Chair Frickberg. This is the uh, the first item that uh, solely deals with matters with CS bars. The rest of the items will be joint. Um, as Chair Frickberg mentioned, the CS bars has been working with the CBE and the Board of Trustees to adopt new rules that will take effect in January. And since the CS bars last met, uh, the Board of Trustees adopted the proposed amended language for the MPR, the minimum cumulative five year bar pass rate, for the purpose of uh, properly incorporating those that participate in or complete the provisional licensure programs pathway to licensure. Uh, the board also adopted the amended uh, fees technical amendments to uh, properly uh, reference the new rule numbers and to add an explicit fee for the jointly accredited status for the schools uh, that would choose that. Uh, in the new year, uh, the applications for the jointly accredited status will issue as well as updated um, annual report forms uh, for the annual reports that will be due toward the end of 2022. I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, seeing none, I think we're ready to move on. Ms. Dean, Park, hand, has, Dean Park. Dean Park has her hand up. Oh, so sorry, Dean Park, please. Oh, no, that's all right. And um, Dean Jessica Park from Abraham Lincoln University. So uh, just in terms of the forms for the jointly accredited law schools to come out, you, do you mean application forms? Yes, the application forms. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, when they are uh, when they are ready, there'll be an announcement made uh, to both accre both accredited and unaccredited law schools. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to the next item. Next, uh, oh, agenda item is a report on options for applicants negatively affected by the technology issues from the July 2001 bar exam. Uh, Audrey Ching is our presenter. Yes, I have the, uh, the next three items and if it's okay with the two chairs, I think I will uh, talk about the July exam, then the February exam, and then the oath cards. So if that's all right, I'll do, the, I'll do it a little out of order. That sounds fine, thank you. Okay. Um, so, and please ask if anyone needs me to go over what the technical issues were, I can do that as well, but I'm going to sort of assume that everyone through the press release and through prior meetings is aware of all the issues in July with the exam soft memory utilization. I can, I can explain that if anyone needs that to be explained. But what I'd like to talk about specifically is the options for those applicants um, who are negatively impacted by that memory utilization issue in July. But please stop me if you want me to back up and give more context, it's no problem. Um, so 
There were 1,298 applicants who were affected by the exam soft memory utilization issue and did not pass the exam. And these applicants have a couple different options. So they can request that their July 2021 fees be applied to the February bar exam. They can re request that their fees be applied to the July 2022 exam, or they can request a full refund of their fees. So they would get, you know, a check back or back on their however they paid um, for the exam. So what I want to highlight, and it kind of ties into what I want to highlight for February, is that to date we've only heard from about 40% of that pool of affected applicants. So if you have a way to encourage alumni to let us know through the applicant portal, especially if they want that credit applied to February, because in February, um, there is um, limited space at some of our test centers. So that was what I wanted to kind of cover about the options. So you can apply to February with the credit, um, you can apply to July, or you can get a full refund. Does anyone have any questions about those options? Uh, Nidia? So I was wondering, what is the deadline um, by which they need to uh, select an we, option? We gave them until January 3rd, um, um, to, but if you, there's a way to encourage, especially if the idea is the credit for February, just so we can make sure that these uh, folks in this pool uh, have their guaranteed seat for the exam. I mean, if there's a way to encourage earlier, that would be great. Um, uh, Dean Bakshan. Hi, Audrey. Hi. Just, I was also going to ask about the deadline, but I would let, is there a way to know which of our grads are in this group? As far as I know, all I have is my regular pass fail list unless I miss something. So we told, we told all of the affected applicants in their result letter. So they all know if they were in the pool. So you could, you know, they will know. They have it. They have the information in their result letter in their applicant portal. Sorry, Amy, did you want to interject? Yes, I want to add one more point. Uh, we also wanted um, to ensure that we heard back from applicants in the event that they want to register for the February or use apply credit to the February bar exam to allow enough time to also apply. So simply letting us know um, that they want to receive credit for the February bar exam is not sufficient. Applicants still are required to uh, uh, register for the exam as well. That's a really good point. So the letting us know doesn't put in an application. They still have to, to complete an application and then we can apply that credit. Are there any more questions about those options? So any help to encourage um, even before January 3rd would be appreciated. Dean Keller. Yeah, just a quick follow up on that. You said they still have to um, apply for February. So I'm just wondering if they've already applied for February, do we think there might be some who are just assuming that because they applied, you're gonna apply, you're going to transfer the fees to that and that's why you haven't heard from some of them no everyone that so we've been we have a list and our um our one of our team members has been cross-checking the list so he he has the list of who's asked for their credit or refund or what they've done to date and who is outstanding on that list to make sure that they are applied correctly that the everyone in the eligible pool gets their credit if they want that credit applied and if we don't hear by January 3rd, we will just issue refunds for the rest of the group who has not responded. Okay, great. That answered my other question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to move on to February, but again, always stop me and ask any questions at all. So we are, I know we put this out in the FAQs when the exam application opened, but just to highlight, we are providing additional space for social distancing at our exam sites. So uh, because of that, we're working um, with a, a slightly different uh, floor plans for our test centers. So today um, we had opened up additional space. So we're trying to monitor, as you can imagine, um, and maybe you've done the same things even when you've had in-person events uh, since this all began, but we're trying to monitor 
the space um, and the spacing that we have for everyone at their seats. So uh, last night was a was a deadline. Um, today there's that uh, for um, for repeaters there starts to be a fifty dollar late fee, and for first time takers a two hundred and fifty dollar late fee. So we did have a rush of applications last night. Um, and the, we opened up more space today. So you might've heard from um, folks looking to apply that they might've had some trouble, but that's been fixed. And I have, a, I have a list of folks who did try to submit before midnight and we're going to uh, obviously not apply the $250 late fee to them and get them through the system because they, had tr they were there applying before 1159. So that's, that's one thing, but just to, again, encourage that we are, we have opened more seats today. By the end of the week, we will be, you know, we're monitoring and opening more seats, but everyone's really encouraged um, to, to apply. I mean, if they're thinking of February, they should go. And they should also, and we always say this, but you may not get your first preference of site, right? You may, and you know, might have to travel a little bit more to take the exam based on where there are seats available. Um, so, and again, I, I already said this, but letting people know who have their credit eligible, that they should put their message into the applicant portal as soon as possible that they want to take the exam in February. We will be uh, posting about additional, you know, every exam that we've had, some test, test takers in person, we've had, a, you know, COVID protocols in place. We will let all the applicants know in advance what those COVID protocols will be for the February exam. Uh, we'll, put, we'll send it out to applicants directly. We'll post in our um, exam FAQs. Um, but I just wanted to mention that um, one thing that we definitely are doing and trying to monitor is the spacing um, for each of our test sites. Uh, Dean Kenyon. Uh, the question that I had and I've heard from students is what about sort of getting into the test room and not that tends to be a little bit of a cattle call what kind of spacing or line management is bar staff going to be doing to make sure people aren't on top of each other and then the other question is enforcement of masking and and sort of how bar staff is going to handle that. So for all that so we have had in person small in person right for um, different reasons for all, oh i'm sorry Donna did you want to go ahead. Uh, no, you can finish responding to the dean, and then I will add something. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we will, we, you know, masking requirements will be in place, um, and we we have been, and we will continue to um, space the line. And we have all all the kind of signage already in terms of the um, the line, and uh, you know, different kinds of what's it called the PPE, the the kind of uh, different sorts of um, plexiglass and everything for the check-in so we we have some some of and that will be in the COVID protocols that we send out to applicants it's all part of our exam planning uh and it's not just for applicants right it's for our staff and for the temporary staff that help at the exams as well so all of those kinds of measures and uh anything that we we need to add for their exams in february we'll be sending out that information but for sure masking and the way that we do the line management will be in place can I just make a request? I know that mess that stuff is going to get messaged to the bar takers. Can you please message it to the deans and the law schools as well so we can help yep. reinforce that message to our bar takers? Absolutely. And I will do as I've been doing any of the message. I will send that out to the whole list that Natalie has um, for me. Then anything that we send out en masse to the February applicants, I will send you a copy straight away so you know what we're sending. Great. Thank you. Donna? Yes, and then I would just add that we have just um, noticed a meeting of the Board of Trustees. I'm, I, I'm speaking slowly because I'm confirming the date right now. Um, we've just noticed a meeting of the Executive Committee for the, um, for the Board of Trustees for December the 10th um, at 3 p.m. And the, um, there are two items on that agenda, uh, but the primary one uh, and the agenda item is posted so you can take a look at it. The, um, the primary item is discussion of February 2022 bar exam test taker proof of COVID-19 vaccination or negative COVID-19 test requirement. There's a recommendation being put forward to the executive committee for discussion at that meeting that test takers be required to, uh, uh, to have proof of vaccination. And if, no, no, if they don't have vaccination, proof of a negative test within 72 hours before the date and time that the uh, that the exam is set to start. So that recommendation will be presented to the Board of Trustees Executive Committee on December the 10th, December the 10th. And um, uh, if the board concurs with that recommendation, then a notice will go out to 
everybody who signed up for the exam. A notice will go out uh, on social media, a notice will go out in FAQ, sort of every way that we can, posting on the website, um, and to make it clear to everyone what this, what this requirement, um, what this requirement is. The Office of Admissions is exploring um, options for um, people uploading their, um, their proof of vaccination uh, prior to the exam so they can get cleared ahead of time. Similar to you know what the state of Hawaii does through Clear, they have a health pass, and you upload and Clear is the one that makes the determination of whether or not it meets the requirements for uh, it is a legitimate vaccination card. And then you know anybody who who gets sort of pre-cleared that way, we could put you know we would have some indication so they would, could go through one line. Um, going back to the issue of sort of the backup at the at the entryways. Um, and have another line for those who, you know, hadn't, um, who hadn't yet uploaded that information or need to show proof of the negative test. Um, if that negative test, you know, came through just, you know, within hours before the exam, they can provide that at check-in. Um, again, this is all contingent on the executive committee approving that recommendation, but I did want to let you all know that that is one of the other things that we are doing um, that we are recommending in order to protect the um, the health and safety of all of those who are coming uh, for the purpose of taking the in-person exam. Thanks, Beth. Smythe, sorry. Yes, I would hate to be uh, pessimistic, but I wonder uh, if you have any contingency plan in place to cover the risk that it might not be possible to have an on-site exam in February. So that's certainly one of the um, one of the issues that that we we know is uh, is is a possibility, and it's dependent upon there being public health orders. That um, if there's a public health order that says that we cannot have an in-person exam either statewide or in counties in which we are scheduled, then we will have to res resort to the remote exam for those purposes. I, I personally have had a conversation with ExamSofts um, about that to make sure that they know that, that for everyone, not just California, um, but if there are public health orders that prevent in-person gatherings of the size that we are anticipating, um, then, then there would have to be a, um, a, a sort of quick job to to an alternative, um, and, and that would be something that would be coordinated nationally um, through uh, National Conference of Bar Examiners. Um, as you know, our right now they are limiting the ability to go to remote absent there being a public health order um, that prevents you from doing it in person. Um, and so, if there are public health orders, they have um, they have said very clearly that they will obviously. Um, adjust as as is needed for states, whether that means that means going remote remains is sort of another option to ensure that we can take the exam safely. Um, you know, we know that they are very attuned to these issues and we are keeping a watch on the public health orders and we'll obviously keep keep NCBE informed and we'll keep applicants informed that the, the um, the question becomes right what happens if that happens on February 15th right that's that's I think the the difficulty is is um, how to trans how to transition in a really short period of time should that um, should that possibility arise Dean Bakshin to follow up, Donna, on the contingency planning, is there a sense that I, I am also trying not to be negative, but concerned about a last minute change? And would we be looking at a potential delay? Uh, is that in the contingency planning, a possibility of it would not take place on those dates if it has to uh, pivot to remote? So I would hate to speculate. Um, I think that the National Conference of Bar Examiners is thinking through all of the options, and I would imagine that that is one of them. Um, I, you know, I can't imagine a scenario where the February exam doesn't happen, right? I don't think anybody is thinking about well, we'll just do it in July. I can't imagine that that's that's you know a possibility. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly, I, I would I would suspect that a delay is part of their calculus of one of the possible um, outcomes that they would recommend. 
Um, and again, because part of our exam is the multi-state um, bar exam, you know, the, the multiple choice part of the exam, um, we, can't, we can't give that unless they give us the questions and give us the ability to deliver that part of the exam. And we are, we're not prepared right now to, to have an exam without the MBE. Um, it's certainly something that we explored back in uh, spring and summer of 2020 um, and how we would be able to pull off an exam that, that has the same validity and reliability without an MBE, um, but that certainly requires extra, uh, extra essay questions, extra performance tests um, that at this point we're not prepared to, uh, to launch. Thanks, Donna. Any, any more questions about February or, or about July before I move on? Dean Park? Hello, this is Dean Park from Abraham Lincoln University. And sorry if I missed this before, but um, in terms of thinking about that contingency planning uh, and with the NCBE being such a crucial play, player um, either way, I was just wondering if that contingency planning is going, um, uh, is there, is NCBE showing any openness to being reached out for that or, um, cause it sounds like that would be such a crucial factor between having the exam go remote on the scheduled date versus delay, so. Yeah, and uh, Audrey and Amy are in much more frequent contact with NCBE than I am, um, but it's something that they've been very, very uh, attuned to from the beginning. Um, they very much want this to be an in-person exam, but understand that there could be health concerns that that um, that prohibit that or that you know require some change in how we go forward. Um, there is there is definite sensitivity to that in all of the conversations certainly that I've had and that I believe Amy and Audrey have had with, with NCBE. Thank you. Dean Hum. Hi, uh, I just wanted to ask about the software. So I'm assuming that we will continue to use ExamSoft for the in-person exams mm -hmm. as well and moving forward indefinitely or is there a timeline at all on whatever the software looks like in the future well definitely for february everyone's going to be using exam soft in the manner that we did pre-pandemic which is they will be submitting you know their um answers in exam soft but they will have um you know the the physical questions as well so that's um how we'll proceed in february i guess when i i you know, how far into the future will be uh, delivered in that manner. Um, right now, I will tell you how it will be in February. Great, thanks. Dean Kenyon. I want to follow up on uh, Dean Hum's question. I appreciate you calling me Dean. I'm not a Dean. I'm a professor, but uh, Professor Kenyon, I'm so sorry. I just no, it's all right. I don't need. Mode. I don't need the. I don't know if it's a promotion, but I don't need it. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the uh, uh, I want to follow up on Professor Hub's question specifically about the uh, the computer, the exam soft issue, and here specifically that we will not be using exam monitor, even though we will be returning to normal exam soft. Right. So there's since we're live, there won't be a need for the monitoring, and it will just be you know the pre-pandemic version, which is just Examplify if you're familiar with the software. Good. Thank you. That's what I thought, but I wanted to make sure I actually heard it said out loud. So. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, okay, well, I'm gonna pivot to a new topic and a new development that you're all aware of, which is the virtual oath cards. Um, I think this is something that a lot of you have probably wanted over the years that we were able to deploy uh, uh, pretty quickly for the release of results for July. And I just wanted to point out a few things, and I know I've communicated with uh, some of you one-on-one -on -one about this process or maybe some of your staff, um, but this was gonna point out a few things. I'm gonna share my screen just in case you don't know where this all lives too. So let me know if, if you can't see something that I'm referring to. But so we have you know, the admissions page and then uh, the California bar examination, and then um, all the way at the bottom, is virtual oath packet. 
So when you click on virtual oath packet, it'll bring up um, a lot of information about uh, the new oath card, uh, the virtual what's in the virtual oath packet. And then of particular interest, I believe, will be this link called oath card instructions because it will talk about the new DocuSign process. So this, a little confusing, the step-by-step -step instruction is about the card itself. And then this link is about the new um, oath card instructions for DocuSign. So I'm going to share what happens when you click on that one second. Well, let me make sure I get the right thing. Um, all right, so hopefully you can see my screen still. And this is what, and this is actually me taking screenshots of my own inbox. So you can all see my emails. But so this is what the applicants will receive. And it will say that they have an email from the State Bar of California via DocuSign. And we'll have our logo. They'll click through to that. And then, um, and if you've used DocuSign, which a lot of folks have, and probably a lot of um, future licensees have used it. So it's, it's really user-friendly. Um, you review the document, you continue, and then you'll see the, the virtual oath card here. Um, since I was doing it in this demo environment, it was not pre-populated, but it comes pre-populated with um, the applicant's name. So they need to fill out the rest and then it's pretty easy. It won't let you hit finish until you complete signing the document. So this is the, the whole part of the card that was always the, um, you know, the onus of the future licensee to fill out. And the um, part that is perhaps a little trickier is the delegation and the printing out for the swearing and officer. Again, these are all, all these instructions are online if you want to review them. Um, so notaries, because they, they um, have a seal, they are not going to, have this delegated to them over email, right? So then you would have, there's one process where you assign the next phase over email to someone and then um, you, the applicant or I guess future licensee or not applicant anymore will assign it to that swearing in officer's name and email address. And then that will send the part they need to sign to someone over email. But for printing and signing for notaries who perhaps want to um, use their seal, they have to print and sign. They can, again, under other actions, do print and sign and then take a physical um, upload of the document to a notary, or if you want them to come to like a admission ceremony with something printed out, um, then you download it and you would have the ability to print it out. Um, sorry, some of these, they're pretty um, self-explanatory. And then you would be able to scan that back um, to this email address. This is again all in the instructions. Scan that oath card back to oathcard at calbar.ca.gov. Once you have um, scanned it and someone has actually physically signed it, if you do the process where you assign it to someone over email, that'll just come back to us automatically. Um, so the swearing officer, when they get an email, it'll look a lot like what I showed for the future licensee, where it will come from the State Bar of California via DocuSign. They're prompted to fill it out. I know a question that um, I will preemptively answer is that the dates. So sometimes the um, date that the future licensee signed may not match the date that, and I put myself as a judge, which I'm not. Here's me, Judge Ching. Um, this, these dates may not match, and it's um, preferred if they do match, but because it's a new process, if these we're looking at these the state over here that the swearing in officer signed, that's the date we're gonna be looking at. So it's not, um, these two dates of, they don't need to do the oath card over again if the future licensee date and the swearing in officer date over, over this electronic process is different. So I, that probably was a question that was going to come up. And then once both parties have signed electronically, um, they both get copies and, of PDF of the uh, card for their records. And then we don't, you don't, no, nothing needs to come back to us again over email. It just automatically comes to, that oath card email address if everyone does it electronically. Um, so that's, and I probably went over that quickly, but it's all posted online. And we can ask, we can ask, uh, you can ask questions. I know something I wanted to make sure, I know a lot of law schools either are planning some of the, the ceremonies for all the uh, future licensees at once. And if you have it in person, I think the easiest thing to do is to have everyone have it physically, print it out and have it signed, 
hand back to the future licensee and then they scan it and send it to that oath card email address so they can you know one by one what our what our attorney um, regulation folks are less enthused about is like a very one very long pdf so if that can be avoided that's great um, and if you do a virtual ceremony and someone is collecting those um still collecting those physical cards mailing that packet back to attorney regulation is again the preference versus scanning and having a, a giant pdf um, so those were sort of the the tips that i've learned about oath cards in the past few weeks we also have um rick rankin our head of the it department has joined um so he's been really instrumental in setting up the docusign process so he might jump in if you have some questions here um, you might see him now in our um folks who are panelists so does anyone have a question and again I, I don't know if i went over that too quickly but um let me know dean park uh, just first of all, just with the statement before my question, I'm I'm very happy that <laughs> this has shifted to a system that can prevent or manage user error and and circulate uh, these documents electronically. Um, I know our our students are very online students are very happy to see that. Um, my question just had to do with those dates because I knew I knew that was crucial before, and we did go through pretty quickly, but I know in the past because uh, really the idea was that the signing is occurring at the same time, those dates were crucial. So, you know, knowing that DocuSign does some user error uh, prevention, uh, what can be expected about those dates? Do they need to be the same or has that just relaxed? I just so I can, you can understand why the attorney regulation folks want, wanted them, them to match. That makes sense when you're doing these like in-person ceremonies with the, the delegation process through DocuSign, we're relying on that date that the swearing in officer has signed. So if they, they don't match, we are going to accept those cards. We're going to go on the date from the swearing in officer. Okay, so it's okay that they're, it's different, but for everyone involved, they should know it's a swearing uh, swearing office uh, officials uh, date that matters. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Professor Kenyon. <laughs> thank you. You can call me whatever you want. I answer. Uh, I I appreciate to hear the sort of advice around the paper printing them out for the swearing in event, um, and I would ask that the bar do some checking in after this happens. This sort of next wave to see if this actually works, because I know the judges that are going to be doing our swearing in have said that they will not deal with them by email, and so we yeah. were already having a little bit of panic about that because I was not one worried about how you all were going to feel about getting the hundred. PDFs from us, but it sounds like you all are prepared for that. So just making sure that this actually works the way it is anticipated after the fact and that we adjust again in the future would be my advice. Yeah, again, again, the preference being that they come one by one. And you know, if you hand it back to the future licensee and they scan it back to oath card, that's what our attorney regulation folks want and not a, a massive PDF. So that's just the, those are the tips that I wanted to pass on. And I, yes, we probably all should, um, regroup and improve the process as we go through it because it is brand new. So yeah, any any insight on how it could be uh, better on your end, please let me know. Oh, and I know um, Rick's on and I see you now, Rick, but um, something that has been happening and you can understand it because it's a new process, but uh, occasionally the future licensee has delegated it to themselves and they've signed both sections. So they've signed that they are both the licensee and the swearing in officer and so we have to manually go back and void all of those out because you can't <laughs> swear yourself in so yeah i think it's the enthusiasm like oh you know it's hooray it's so it's here and i've got my and it's it is really easy to do but the um those all get voided and that's kind of then that will, will extend and delay for that person to wait for us to void out their card because you can't swear yourself in uh dean keller so we actually uh, did a swearing in event a couple of days ago, and most people we had advised to bring in their hard copies, but there was one person who, when it printed, it printed, it cut off the bottom somehow. So mm -hmm. he had to pull up, he pulled up DocuSign on his phone, and I think what he did was he delegated it to himself, and then he handed it to the judge then to sign it. Um, and I'm wondering now, is that going to be 
a problem uh, or is that acceptable? Because it was the judge actually signing it. Um, and then the judge, I was actually happened to be sitting right there as the judge said, so, so is this it? Do I hit submit? And this, you know, that the uh, new attorney said, yes. So I'm hoping we can work that out. I'm happy to talk offline if that's easier. We might have to look at that um, specific case. Rick, did you, because I think that if they, if they put in their own email, it might've put their name and not the judges. Yeah, the DocuSign records will show that they signed it, even though the, the digital signature and the name and title are most likely the judges. So I, th I think our attorney regulation folks will need to consider that. That's, that's a use case we haven't heard of yet yeah. uh, that I'm aware of. Um, I, I think our attorney regulation folks will look at it and make a call whether they can accept that or whether they want it to be redone. Okay, so who, if I want to have my colleague reach out to the uh attorney who well the graduate who thinks he's now a new attorney because he thinks <laughs> everything is all set where 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 who should be the contact person that you we can say? just send it to me and and rick and i will figure it out okay all right i will uh get some more info and have uh, myself or my colleague contact you thanks so much we also i could also just can i just add on a quick comment we're working with ocusign to uh, figure out a way to prevent folks from um, delegating back to themselves because that's clearly not the intent with the way we set it up. So we're we're working on fixing that with the uh, the vendor DocuSign. And also, we have a dedicated email box in the event that there are other questions really related to the oath card, um, and it's oathcard at calbar.ca.gov. Yep, the same email address where if you have a notary or someone who signs it, um, a printed copy, that's the same email address you will scan that. You Not maybe you, but you being the uh, future attorney will scan and send it back, so yes. And that's being checked every day and responded to, so. Any questions about our new exciting process? I think um, I might be done then, Nat. <laughs> Uh, it's true, and uh, our next presentation had been special set for 2 p.m., but our presenters were so kind as uh, to come a little bit early. Thank you to both of them. So I'll turn it back to the chairs um, for our next item, the uh, paraprofessional program. Thank you. Uh, and again, this should be a very interesting one, I believe. The paraprofessional program has been a, an idea for a while. It's starting to come to fruition. And I'll turn it over to back to you, Ms. Leonard. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask Raquel to please promote our presenters, uh, State Bar staff Linda Katz, who staffed the working group that um, created this recommendation, as well as Dean Emeritus Iris Byro, who uh, was previously the Dean of People's College of Law. He also uh, participated on the working group and is here uh, for the question period today. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to them and thank them for the recommendation that's currently posted for public comment. Thank you. Um, and I'm uh, gonna present information about the paraprofessional program working groups recommendations. Um, we initially presented what the, our work about a year ago when we were kind of at the early or mid uh, stage of the program and we did seek input and I know we had some um, input from some of the deans. And I want to give um, Ira a chance to introduce himself because Ira was a key member of the working group and was very involved in the recommendations. So if you want to. Hi. Um, well, I know a lot of you. Uh, I was the dean of People's College of Law for a little over four years, uh, ending in August. And uh, and I was a member of the, still I am a member of the working group on the paraprofessional program. Um, we all worked very hard on it. It's controversial, but we all, and we all worked very hard on it. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, share a presentation about the program. I can, here it is. So can everyone see that? I'm going to I'm going to run through some of this uh, rel the beginning part relatively quickly so I can focus more on the part that might be of, of more interest 
to this group. But, and I think this is something that we discussed, what, what is a legal paraprofessional? So uh, based on the recommendations that are out for public comment, it's a licensed and regulated professional who can provide legal advice in authorized practice area for which the paraprofessional is licensed within a designated scope of practice for each practice area. And the, the analogy we have is to nurse practitioners who are able to provide some level of medical care outside um, the supervision of a doctor. And as we discussed about a year ago, uh, the reason we're doing this is, has to do with the justice gap. We did a justice gap study that was uh, for California that was published in 2019. It was modeled after the ABA uh, that, I mean, the Legal Services Corporation uh, Justice Gap Study, the nationwide study that was published in 2017. And we, our findings were consistent with the national um, Justice Gap Study that there's 55% of Californians experience at least one civil uh, legal problem in their household in the year in which the study was uh, completed. And there's not a significant difference between those above and below the 125% of the federal poverty level. At the time of the study, that was the cutoff line for eligibility for free legal services. That's going up to uh, 200% as of January of next year. When the working group considered the areas of practice that should be included, we turned to the justice gap study to see what were the areas of greatest need. In the end, the recommendations don't include all of these practice areas based on the research that was done in the, by the subcommittees that were looking at the practice areas. For example, health, even though health was the most significant need. And what this encompasses is people who were denied access to healthcare that they needed either care or devices or billed for services that should have been covered in their insurance. The working group found that uh, services for that, those types of problems are available for free uh, regardless of income. And so uh, the recommendation was that rather than providing services through paraprofessionals, the focus should be on making sure that Californians are aware that these services are currently available. We also found that Californians receive inadequate or no legal help at all for 85% of their problems. And again, there's not a distinction whether uh, people are above or below the 125% of the federal poverty level. The justice gap study found that the main reasons people do not seek legal help is that there's a lack of knowledge about what constitutes a legal issue. They decide to deal with a problem without help or they were concerned about the cost of legal services. And we did this analysis, this um, $338 average hourly rate, that's based on the uh, uh, study done by Clio, a report issued by Clio in 2020. And um, as you probably are all aware, Clio is a law office um, management software program that's used by mostly um, small to mid-sized firms. So this $338 an hour is probably on the low side in California. Um, the sample annual income is a mid-range income in California. And what, you, as you can see, someone would have to work 10 hours to purchase one hour of attorney services. And that's 10 hours of pre-tax dollars. We looked at potential solutions. One of them uh, that we looked, the first one that we looked at was to increase funding for legal aid. This is something that's been suggested by a lot of people. And we found that we would need to increase the number of legal aid attorneys roughly tenfold to provide services for everybody who is at below 200% um, of the federal poverty level. Um, another suggestion that we hear is that there should be required pro bono services and increase the number of pro bono hours. The analysis found that for um, to serve the needs of people who are above 200% of the federal poverty level, 
every attorney in California would have to provide 250 hours of pro bono services per year. And currently attorneys provide, uh, a, well, 54% of attorneys provide zero hours of uh, pro bono services. That's based on an ABA survey that was conducted in 2017. The other recommendation was a decrease in the bar exam cut score. And this is something that a lot of people have um, argued for. And as you are all aware, the bar exam cut score was reduced a couple of years ago. That's resulted in about 75 more attorneys being admitted annually. And we did an analysis if we reduced the cut score to the lowest in the country, that would increase, that would provide another 600 admittees annually. And um, even if every single one of them decided to go into uh, legal aid uh, services to reach that 13,600, it would take quite a long time to get to that level. So the option that we decided to pursue is regulatory reform. And the recommendations that have been uh, developed by the working group and that are out for public comment, they address the dual goals of the program. This is pursuant to the charter of the working group to increase access to legal services at, at the same time ensuring protect, public protection. Um, so the practice areas that ultimately are included in the, in the current recommendation are co collateral criminal, and that's limited to expungements and reclassifications of convictions, as well as um, an, in representation in infractions. Consumer debt and general civil is, has to do with um, mostly creditor harassment, enforcement of judgment, and also name and gender changes included in that category. Um, income maintenance includes wage and hour proceedings and importantly, judgment enforcement in wage, wage and hour cases, unemployment insurance proceedings and public benefit proceedings. And family, these are the, the most complex areas, family, children and custody um, and housing. And Ira was on the, the subcommittee that looked at um, housing and it, it's limited to residential landlord tenant um, and lien clearing and then family children in custody as you can see it's it's divorce and separation as well as um, uncontested adoptions and conservatorship and, and guardianship as well as all types of violence prevention restraining orders so now we get to i think the area that will be of most interest to uh, this group the eligibility requirements um, for the program, so the, the overall licensing requirements specify eligibility for admission or for to even apply for the program. And then once you've met those requirements, there's the there are education requirements spelled out, experience, experiential requirements, testing, and moral character. So I'm gonna take a little bit more time for this. So at at a threshold level, the recommendations are that that in order to even apply for the program, an applicant would have to have either a JD or an LLM from an ABA or California accredited or registered law school. They could also be a paralegal, a, a, a qualified paralegal or a legal document assistant. And it only includes currently one category of legal um, document assistant. It's, it's those that are, um, that have a, a bachelor's degree, if that's the only way they're qualifying. So uh, LDAs that have, are limited to a high school diploma would not be eligible under the current recommendations. So once someone is determined to be eligible to apply, they would have to meet the educational requirements. So as you can see, the, there's 13 units of universal requirements. So everybody, regardless of the practice area, has to have these meet these 13 units. And then in addition, there are practice area specific uh, educational requirements. And, um, and I think we talked about this um, a year ago when we were when we met with this group. The uh, unlike an attorney license, it's the paraprofessional license is not a general license. So a, a paraprofessionals would have to be licensed in the specific practice area for which they want to practice. So 
if someone wanted to do the collateral criminal, it would be three units in addition to the 13 for consumer debt and general civil. It's nine and a half units in addition to the 13. And then, um, Uh, family, children in custody and housing have the highest educational requirements. So it's 26 units total. Uh, one thing that's important is that the education requirements would allow for someone who took the relevant courses as part of their law school or paralegal education would be able to waive out of these requirements. So if someone um, took courses in family law or in these other uh, categories of you know, ethics and professional responsibility. If they took the coursework during the course of their legal education, they wouldn't have to repeat it as part of the paraprofessional education. There is an experiential requirement, thousand hours over at least six months, including 500 hours in the practice area and, and trauma informed training is included in this. And again, if someone did uh, like a clinical uh, program in law school, or if a paralegal has been practicing under uh, an attorney supervision, those hours would count towards this experiential uh, requirement. There, there's testing that's required in the, again, in the specific subject matter, as well as a professional responsibility exam that is modeled after the attorney professional responsibility exam. And again, the moral character requirements also are, they mirror the attorney moral character requirements, but there's a prohibition on somebody who was disbarred or resigned with charges pending in any jurisdiction, they would not be eligible for the paraprofessional program. In terms of the education requirements, we have begun conversations with the California community, community Colleges. We've met, met a few times with the board of the California Community Colleges um, to, to talk about development of the curriculum for the program. The idea is that we wanna make this an affordable path for people. So, um, and the co community colleges are very interested so, and we will be working with them to develop the specific curriculum. We'll be working with uh, subject matter experts and curriculum development experts to develop a specific curriculum for the, these um, for this program to determine what needs to be included in each of the subject matter areas, as well as in the, the core requirements. Um, the regulation requirements include financial responsibility. Unlike attorneys, paraprofessionals will be required to have a surety bond that's similar to licensing requirements for other professionals, the professionals that are licensed under DCA uh, boards. Uh, many of them are required to have a bond and that was the recommendation that um, was developed by the paraprofessional working group. MCLE, it's a, as you can see, it's a higher requirement than for attorneys. This is based on the certified specialist requirements. So 28 hours in the practice area, in addition to uh, legal ethics and competence and these other requirements. Um, and in terms of proactive regulation, what, what I wanna focus on is this annual re reporting requirement. There was a lot of discussion about whether uh, caps should be imposed on the fees that paraprofessionals would charge. Ultimately, the decision was that there would not be a cap on fees, but that they would be required to report what they charge. Um, and then after the, during the initial um, evaluation period, that data would be reviewed to determine whether that question about fee caps should be revisited and reconsidered. Uh, fully articulated rules of professional conduct are out for public comment. Um, they are based on the attorney rules. They have substantially more informed consent and disclosure requirements and written agreement requirements. Fee sharing with lawyers in different firms is not permitted, but under the current rec recommendations and allow for co-ownership with lawyers, but the paraprofessional ownership 
needs to be a minority ownership. Um, and here are, this is not an exhaustive list, but this, this is an, a sample of the required disclosures that are in the rules of professional conduct. Uh, and importantly, they paraprofessionals would be required to disclose to their potential clients that they might be eligible for free legal services and that those services might be available to them. Um, we did hear a lot of concern from the legal services community that people might unwittingly pay for services that they could get for free. And this is intended to um, minimize the, the chance of that happening. The, the question of co-ownership of a law firm was also hotly debated. And ultimately the decision was that that should be allowed with the idea that it would be, it's a more efficient way to provide services that the paraprofessional can, can do the work that is within the scope of their services, that the attorney in, an, in, a fir, in the same firm could provide those services. It wouldn't require telling the para, their client that they should go somewhere else to find services that the paraprofessional is unable to provide. Another big concern we heard about was the, un, prevent, was the unauthorized practice of law and how there might be an increase in the unauthorized practice of law as a result of creating this license. It's not really clear to us how uh, licensing a new professional is likely to lead to the increased unauthorized uh, pra practice of law, but cognizant of the concerns, there are some recommendations included that address uh, ways to strengthen um, enforcement in these areas. So um, including increased resources for district attorneys to prosecute cases um, and increased resources for the state bar to prosecute cases and uh, stronger uh, measures, including harsher penalties and felony prosecution. And paraprofessionals, would be required to retain their uh, files to ensure that they, so that a review can be done to ensure that they didn't um, exceed the scope of their practice. So that's not a, a requirement that attorneys have to retain their files, except under very limited circumstances in some criminal cases. The discipline system that's been recommended it um, is a hybrid between what we have for attorneys and what's used in uh, boards under the jurisdiction of the Department of Consumer Affairs. So the, the intake and the investigation and the prosecution would be handled by the Office of Chief Trial Counsel, but the hearings would not be at state bar, in the state bar court. Hearings would be held through a hearing panel, and that would be a... Um, uh, it's not a rotating panel, but a, a panel of trained um, uh, uh, people on that panel who would uh, be paid a stipend for their work. Um, importantly, there, this, the paraprofessional discipline does not contemplate any private discipline, so no private approvals. Everything would be um, uh, public. And the disciplinary standards that have de been developed mirror the attorney discipline standards. Um, the recommendations also include uh, measures that are not uh, uh, provided for discipline of attorneys. So citation and fine is included in the recommendations. In court representation, this was an, another topic where there was um, uh, disagreement about whether that should be included, but ultimately the working group did recommend that in-court representation should generally be allowed except for representation in jury trials. There are some limitations on what would be allowed in terms of um, in-court representation. And in some cases, uh, rep rather than representation, the um, paraprofessionals would be limited to providing in-court support. So sitting with their client at counsel table, advising them, answering direct questions from a, a judge, but, but not providing representation in these limited areas. 
So um, in family, children in custody, it would be in case of an emergency custody visitation orders and domestic violence uh, hearings involving children. In housing, um, there was a recommendation that uh, paraprofessionals not be able to represent people in either uh, jury trials or bench trials. And um, in consumer debt, all superior court litiga litigation is excluded. Um, I'm not gonna go into the detail of how we came up with the licensing names. Suffice it to say that there was a lot of consideration about ensuring that there's not confusion, that the name is clear and, and allows for consumers to understand what paraprofessionals are um, allowed to do and not allowed to do to distinguish them from lawyers. These are the names that are currently out for public comment. We did get some professional translation um, and recommendations from trans translation agencies. Due to time constraints, we only did this with the Spanish options, but the um, once a name is selected, we would do the same for um, other languages that are prevalent in California. Mr. Murphy, did you wanna ask a question? Yes, uh, I, I appreciate that you've looked at the ABA study and you've got apparently a California study on the need for uh, these practitioners. Uh, have there been any studies done to see whether there's an actual market, ready market for their services? Um, it doesn't follow that just because there's a need that there are actually people will pay for the services. And I'm just wondering if you've done any, any studies on marketability. That is something that we're undertaking now. But we do know that in when we look to other places, Washington has had this um, for quite a while. And there are, unfortunately, the Washington Supreme Court for a number of reasons, and there's disagreement about what the reasons were for them to, um, they, they sunset their program. But there are people who were licensed and continue to be licensed under the Washington program. And they have, there's a, a really good market for it and they're, they're um, doing well. Similarly, in um, in Ontario, Canada, yeah, I, I read have, just, just the opposite with respect to Washington. I'd be interested in those articles that you referred to because um, what I read it was largely a failure. Uh, partly because there were not many people who actually wanted to go through the process of uh, you know becoming licensed under this program. Uh, um, there, there, this wasn't much a market for the, the let's call them students. Uh, to become a legal licensed legal practitioner. As a consequence of that, there, I understood that there wasn't much actual market development among, among the populace. But I, as I said, I, 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 can't, I can't put my finger on the articles now, but uh, I had understood that it was largely a failed experiment there. And some of the, some of the thought was because the, the restrictions that Washington had put on it that maybe some other states might not. Right. And, and I, th I think part of the issue in Washington was that the, the, the requirements to entry were very high and our working group was very cognizant of that and so the 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 um the requirements for admission to the program are not quite as stringent but but i will say that for the people who were licensed in in washington and when it, when the the program was sunset they were in the process of expanding to other practice areas and there were a number of people in the pipeline being uh, to be licensed but what we heard from people who are licensed is there really is a market for their services and they are practicing so that is what we did here we were also told there was a lot of uh, opposition to continuing the program uh, from the, as you might imagine, from the bar in Washington, the, the lawyers, I should say. Yes, that was a factor. So I just have a couple more slides left and then I can answer any other questions. The recommendations contemplate uh, um, a phased rollout of the program. So initially, the, it'd be just in these practice areas, collateral, criminal, family, and housing, and in uh, specific counties rather than statewide, with, with the idea that this initial rollout would be for three, about three years after which uh, an evaluation would be undertaken. And then um, 
the, an, it would expand to other practice areas and other than the rest of the state informed by the evaluation that was undertaken. Any modifications to the program would, would reflect the evaluation. These are the, the minimum evaluation metrics that were identified. There obviously might be more, but the, these are the minimums. So program viability, as you were uh, just uh, asking about whether there's a market and um, whether there would be enough licensees to uh, have the program be self-sustaining and self-funding, um, equity and access, case outcomes, um, legitimacy and sustainability and affordability. So this is where uh, the timeline that we envision for the program. Right now, the recommendations are out for public comment. They were issued in, on September 23rd for a 110 day public comment period that goes through January 12th. So if you wanna make public comment, we really encourage you to do so. Um, if you haven't done so yet, we, we're getting a significant amount. I was just looking at it today. We've, we've gotten a significant amount of public comment and looking forward to getting more. Um, the working group is scheduled to meet in February to review the public comment and make any potential recommend, uh, changes to the recommendations, after which the board will, uh, if, if, if they choose, the board of trustees will approve and submit the final program design to the Supreme Court and seek authorization to pursue the program with the legislature. And if the Supreme Court authorizes this uh, for us to do so, then we'll submit the program to the, uh, the proposal to the legislature. We'll work with the legislature to uh, develop the, um, the uh, st statutory amendments that need to be put in place and then go back to the board and, and anticipated in January of 2023 and submit the final recommendations to the Supreme Court. And we hope that the Supreme Court would issue a final approval in uh, April of 2023, at which point the program would launch. So that's the end of my presentation. I see Donna has more to add. I want to invite you to do so. Yeah, so I, I just want to stress one, one point. The, the um, Linda's presentation started off with the uh, reference to the justice gap study that California did in uh, 2019, published in, in uh, January 2020. Um, and one of the incredibly important findings from that justice gap study is that that justice gap exists up and down the income scale. Um, it is not, I, I think when we talk, we use the words justice gap. Um, and in that context, when we talk about legal services, I think there is, um, the mindset is that we're focusing on low income individuals, individuals who are at 125% or, or less of poverty. Um, but, but, the, um, but the justice gap study found that, that, uh, that, the, that the needs um, uh, that, you know, as Linda had referenced, 55% of the uh, population had one or more legal needs over the course of the 12 months prior to the survey. 85% um, of the legal problems um, received uh, inadequate or no uh, resolution, um, and that also up and down the income scale. And so really the focus area um, for the paraprofessionals is not those who can be served by, um, by, uh, by, by legal services that are available for free to indigent persons. Um, and we're we're frankly very excited that the um, that uh, that legal services starting January 2022 uh, we can start funding them for services provided to people at 200 percent or below of the income of the federal poverty level and not just 125 percent. But there are so many people who are at 250 percent, 300 percent, 400 percent of the federal poverty level still earning very little money and certainly unable to afford the um, the rates of a lawyer as Linda sort of published some of the the sort of the modest rates um, from Clio um, simply cannot afford an attorney for their legal work um, and so we really are focusing on those um, and this gets a little bit to Greg's question as well we're focusing on those who don't have access to free legal services 
have no ability to afford or very limited ability to afford an attorney, um, but do have critical legal needs which can be assisted by people who have uh, training and education in, uh, in certain areas that we have identified through this program. Um, and so it really is sort of, uh, trying to, to help those for whom there really is no help right now. Um, there's just sort of, there's no real opportunity for them to get legal, legal representation, to get legal information and advice um, uh, because they may not qualify for, for free legal services from legal aid organizations and simply can't afford, uh, afford an attorney. So I just wanted to stress that point about really the, the, the audience um, that we're focusing on uh, who would be the recipient of these uh, services from paraprofessionals. Linda, you're on mute. Dean Clancy, do you have a question we can answer? Yes, uh, Linda, you mentioned that a similar program exists in Ontario, Canada. I'm curious about it. And I know that one does exist in England. Uh, in England, for a couple of centuries, they've had a bifurcated legal profession made up of solicitors and barristers, but about 10 to 20 years ago, a third category of practitioner developed, one that they call uh, legal executive. And I'm wondering if you have checked that out to find out what their experience has been in England, but uh, mainly curious about what you know about Ontario, Canada. Ontario has licensed um, a paralegals to provide independent legal services. I don't know exactly how long it's been, but it's been quite a while. And they provide all kinds of services and it's a very successful program. People use them. Haven't really looked that much into the one in um, England. All right, I haven't either. I just know that it does exist. And uh, some years ago, not many years ago, they classified uh, that type of practitioner as a lawyer. So they have the solicitors, the barristers, and now the, the legal executives as lawyers. And it's something, that classification, something that's developed out of what had been at one point managing clerks and in solicitors' offices. And I think the experience over there has been generally good, but I, I don't know the, the numbers. I don't know the experience exactly. It may be worth checking out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Leo? Yes, thank you. I uh, want to first commend staff for what I thought was just an excellent um, presentation, in both visually and also substantively. And, you know, this is obviously going to generate quite a bit of controversy and blowback from the, uh, the membership. And my first question um, is, uh, what effort to date have you made to provide the same presentation information to the local bar associations? Because I think if you can you know, educate, it really is an educational issue to so many people who've been practicing law and uh, people, I, I just got an email, I'm, I'm now down in Orange County and a member of the Orange County Bar and, and got um, from a friend who's been a member for many years, a, a long, relatively angry thread I guess you could characterize it of comments within the bar association as to you know what what's the bar doing now because the vast majority of people practicing have no clue that you know or just learned. I mean I know the email went out to the membership about um, the public comment. So my first question would be you know to the extent that it may not be uh, too late is to offer a similar Zoom presentation to as many uh, bar association. Um, certainly uh, uh, officers or memberships and, and, and get, you know, the, the, the one fact that I think would stun everybody, it sort of stunned me, and, and I practiced for over 30 years, is the fact that um, less than half of California attorneys offer any pro bono. Um, and my response to a friend of mine who <laughs> sent me an email, and it was, uh, I've known him, he was a law school classmate 45 years ago, and, uh, you know, we got into a bit of a debate because he doesn't understand the, the necess necessity of what's being proposed. And, and I just asked him, how many pro bono hours have you provided uh, in the last, uh, say, 20 years? And uh, 
he didn't respond. So I think the answer is zero. So I, I think it, it, it need, you need to get this information out and, and uh, it's well presented. I mean, the information, you know, this, the graphs and all that. So again, uh, Linda, very much to your credit. And I know having spoken to Ira about this while he was on the working group, I have a good idea of just how much time and effort and debate and discussion uh, went into this. So um, the members should, should know uh, what's happened and, and you know, what, uh, why the need is as frankly as acute as I think it is. And the last comment I'll make is personal experience. Uh, I, I probably handled cases in you know, 15 or more counties in California, mostly, mostly in Northern California. And if a, if a member has not sat during a law in motion hearing uh, in a relatively small rural county, where they would normally normally handle everything, you know, in the county uh, system at the time, and see, you know, proper litigant after proper litigant, both plaintiff and defendant, come up and try to um, handle uh, what, you know, to to an attorney would have been a, a, a modest or relatively easy problem, but for people, particularly with family law issues, uh, is a monumental, you know, uh, uh, challenge to their life, and it uh, it will convince as it did me many, many years ago, that there are far too many Californians who have no access at all to, to good legal advice. So I'll leave it at that, but I'd be interested to hear what you have planned for the, uh, for the bar associations. Well, well, thanks. We have been, we've presented to a number of bar associations and the plan is to keep doing that. It's, it, it's challenging now that at this time of year, um, but we have made presentations to a few and I know something is the, the Los Angeles County Bar, which has been very much against this uh, program from the beginning, we've been hearing about from them uh, and their members uh, all through the program. They have set up uh, a presentation in the form of a debate um, in, uh, later this month, but we've made presentations to the San Francisco Bar, the Alameda Bar, and I think that there are some others planned you also did San Diego. I never San Diego, that's right. that one. Yes. <laughs> it's a lively discussion. I've also made uh, presentations to the uh, California Employment Lawyers Association, which is really Employees Lawyers Association. I'm a member, and uh, uh, we had a Zoom meeting or two about it. Uh, but I, I want to say one thing. The, the, what I've heard is the main uh, objection from uh, lawyers uh, to this program is that uh, ownership, the, the, the contention that it uh, will allow ownership of law firms uh, by non-lawyers. Now, yes, it does technically. Uh, I say that for, technically for this reason. The, it, it does allow paraprofessionals to uh, uh, be up to 49% uh, uh, ownership of law firms. In other words, firms with lawyers and paraprofessionals in them. But the important thing about that to me is that the paraprofessionals are subject to the same ethics restrictions as the lawyers. So it, it, it would bother me if there were owners of law firms who are not subject to the same ethics restrictions. But our proposed program doesn't do that. Now, the programs uh, you know, being discussed by a, uh, I'll call it a, another, another working group uh, of the bar. What's the name of it, Linda? Um, the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group. Yeah, which, which is working on something called a sandbox uh, proposal or experiment. That does, in potentially a very big way, a very big and, in my view, harmful way, open uh, ownership of law firms and control of law firms and decision-making in law firms, open that up to people who are not subject to any of the uh, ethics, uh, professional responsibility, um, uh, obligations that lawyers and possibly eventually paraprofessionals will have. Maybe some, maybe two or three they're proposing, but nothing, nothing like we lawyers and possibly the paraprofessionals will be uh, governed by. 
Thanks, Ira. Um, Dean Fredberg. Thank you. I just wanted to take a moment to thank you, Ms. Katz, Dean Spiro, and your working group. I can only imagine the, the arguments that have sculpted this to come forward to this stage finally. Uh, I think also what I want to take away from your presentation, I think is an interesting one I'll try and pass along, that it's not a zero sum game. Uh, these are not people who are going to compete with lawyers for their practice of law. But uh, and I'm a firm believer, I think we have our best legal system in the world. I, I, equal under law, I'm a firm believer in. However, we do not have equal representation. We do not have equal access. I think this will help give that access while, again, not competing with lawyers. It is I think the concern that I constantly hear, are they can compete? No, because this is not an area that lawyers are occupying because they don't wish to provide these services at those rates. So again, I just wanted to say thank you. Oh, and about conversation, uh, competition, let me say this, the, the uh, in-court representation by the paraprofessionals is extremely limited. Um, it, th there is no in-court representation in any case that is above the uh, limited, limited case uh, level, $25,000. And just uh, and except for unlawful detainer and what some family law cases where they can sit, the paraprofessionals don't represent the uh, client in the way that a lawyer does. But they can sit in and, and advise them, uh, sitting next to them in the hearing and answer direct questions from the judge. Thanks. Uh, Dean Hum. Hi, I'm sorry if I missed this, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about who's providing this education. You mentioned community colleges a little bit in your presentation, or is it law schools? Um, I think I missed that piece. So it, it, there's a, a, a little bit of both. So in terms of the education, we are working with the community colleges to develop the curriculum and to offer the programs. But if someone has gone to law school and has taken the same courses as part of their education, though that those courses would qualify toward meeting those requirements. I see. So uh, typically, though, you um, anticipate that the bulk of people um, receiving this degree would be getting it through um, a community college program. Right, because we really have an interest in making this a this license affordable and accessible to people. And so if a law school wanted to offer this, this coursework to allow people to be licensed, there's nothing that would prohibit them from do, doing so. It's, it's just a matter of whether they could do so uh, competitively with the community colleges in terms of the cost. You know, it occurred to me that, that there's a couple of ways where it could be competitive. Now, I may be wrong, Linda, Linda knows more about this than I'd say anybody in the state, maybe Leah Wilson uh, uh, also. Uh, Linda was the bar staff person assigned to it and she really is, is the expert. Um, anyway, uh, um, it occurred to me that law schools could offer these programs online and, and it could be affordable and uh, and also that maybe law schools should do some kind of uh, uh, partnership with community colleges in offering this, these programs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Dean Smith, Smythe. Yes, I'm, I'm also merely a professor. Oh, sorry, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> but let me express uh, uh, a few concerns uh, about the proposal. I really like the idea, obviously. I think we all like the idea of seeing legal uh, services uh, extended to, to people who can't to really afford them. I do uh, worry, uh, though, uh, about uh, recent graduates from law schools, especially law schools such as my own. Uh, some of them, uh, even after they acquire licenses, uh, uh, do not have uh, at least in recent years, have not had the, the best uh, employment opportunities. Some of them uh, to try to establish solo uh, practices. I can't uh, for a minute believe that they're charging $338 uh, an hour. I know that's uh, 
uh, likely not the case. And they're certainly uh, not working at as many hours as they would like at that early stage in their career. And I think uh, many of them uh, would uh, not uh, be above uh, taking on a, a good amount of the work that uh, this plan contemplates the paraprofessionals might do. I do worry, uh, therefore, uh, about uh, uh, the uh, entry of uh, uh, budding uh, new solo practitioners into the market and uh, how uh, this uh, might uh, uh, impact uh, their, their market opportunities as they try to establish uh, solo practices. I'm not saying that's a reason uh, not to proceed with the program, but it does strike me as an issue. I also have some concern uh, about uh, the uh, requirements for a JD graduate who does not acquire a law license uh, to become a, a paraprofessional. I suppose a JD graduate who misses the cut score on the bar by a small number of points uh, might be attracted to the idea of doing paraprofessional work. At my law school, I don't think we offer courses that exactly duplicate uh, the courses uh, paraprofessionals would take under this plan. And so I, I presume those JD graduates, uh, if they wanted to do that, would have to go to community college or uh, go uh, somewhere else to take those courses. Even if the cost of the courses was small, the opportunity cost of their time uh, might be quite uh, significant. Uh, and uh, so uh, I, I do wonder if uh, uh, the requirements could be lowered for JD graduates without a law uh, license as well. Anyway, I just wanted to express those issues, those concerns. And we welcome your public your comment on that. If you want to submit that to the public comment, that would be great. We'll certainly consider that. We are going to be bringing the, all the comments to the working group, and the working group will be modifying its recommendations. So please submit that, your recommendations. About the competition, um, I wanted to, it occurred to me this. Um, a lot of the new lawyers that I know uh, um, start their practices, if they're going to be in sole practice, start their practices with contingency cases, and the paraprofessionals are not allowed to charge contingency fees. Dean Park? Uh, thank you for that presentation. I just want to echo of what everyone is saying that we can see the, the need and also just uh, the amount of work the committee has done. Um, I just had a few questions just based on what I was seeing through the slides. So uh, kind of piggybacking off of the local bar association outreach question. Um, I can see the geography of the rollout is in certain places in California. And um, it seems logical, of course, or, or will be planned outreach there. I was just wondering in terms of community college outreach, is it really targeted at community colleges in those geographical areas or um, is, it, it, I guess I'm asking too, maybe um, is, there, is there a logic to why certain places were picked? Yeah. Yes, there is. And, and if you look into our 1400 page report there there are details there was a working uh, there was a, a subcommittee that looked at what the implementation should look like they considered a number of factors part of it was uh, the need based on the justice gap study uh, as well as sort of the saturation of attorneys in the population. That's why San Francisco is not included because there's a high ratio of attorneys to the overall population. So there were a number of factors that were considered. Um, and we're, we're getting a lot of feedback about the exclusion of Los Angeles from the initial implementation. And that's largely just, it's, if we did Los Angeles in the initial implementation, that's probably all we could do just because 
it's a third of the state's population. And so um, that's why the selection was for Orange County in Southern California. And, wow. and in terms of the community colleges, yes. The idea is that we'll work with the community colleges to ensure that the courses are offered in the counties of the initial rollout. And we're also looking at um, the online, just like Ira had suggested, um, an online program. There are some community colleges that offer courses online and then that would be accessible to people wherever they live. Got it, no, thank you. Uh, and I think I, I had a, a follow-up to that. Um, in terms of who is reviewing these courses or setting standards for evaluation, uh, is it con contemplated who would be doing that? Who is who's kind of communicating that expectation to the community colleges? And is there eventually a plan for information that um, other interested institutions would also understand how that coursework is being evaluated ultimately for the licensing pathway? Yes. So the, the we're at the very early stages in terms of the development of the curriculum, but the plan is that we would work with the subject matter experts in the, each of the uh, practice areas, along with curriculum development experts and the community colleges to develop the curriculum and what needs to be included in each of the courses. And once that was developed, there would be standards then that would be uh, uh, published and whatever schools wanted to offer the program would be able to do so as long as they conform to the requirements of the program, the educational requirements. Got it. Thank you. Is that, is, I know that's a pretty unique thing, but is that, is that set within the larger time frame as well? Could you give me a picture of what? Um, well, that's going to be, you know, it's 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 a little bit tricky because we want to start working on it, but we really need to make sure that we have buy-in from the Supreme Court and the legislature. So why we've started these preliminary discussions, but um, until we've really, it's clear that the legislature and the Supreme Court are supportive of us moving forward. We can't go, you know, invest too much. And I think the schools aren't going to be interested in investing that much until they're confident that the program is going to move forward. So I think probably beginning in the middle of next year, does that sound right to you, Donna, that we start really more intensively looking at this curriculum development? Yeah, I mean, as Linda said, it really is a, a delicate balance. We we um, we are committed to ensuring that we get legislative support for moving forward, and we you know certainly don't want to appear as if we are you know moving forward without that legislative support. And so it, it really is just a delicate balance, just to make sure that we have that there is a sort of enough um, indication that this is that this is something that is moving forward in the way we we're anticipating before we launch those uh, those more intensive efforts at the curriculum development, but not wanting to wait so long that the program's ready to launch and we don't have curriculum, right? It's it's a it, it's a delicate balance. And so we'll certainly keep everyone uh, everyone apprised um, as we're as we're moving forward. It's you know certainly an opportunity that as we were in the very, very, very early stages of thinking about the group. Um, that we thought, you know, this might be an opportunity for uh, for some of the law schools to, you know, advertise even to their students that, you know, those who are interested in the, you know, proceeding as a potentially proceeding as a paraprofessional, you know, these courses meet the requirements for your JD as well as for the paraprofessional, and so it really provide an opportunity for some law schools to to really um, provide um, options and opportunities for their students. No, I, I appreciate that. And I figured there's definitely a horse before the wagon issue in terms of the timing, but thank you for handling my question. Just, I know my staff would be curious about this. So thank you. Thanks. Dean Leo. Oh, hi, thanks again. Just a couple quick points. One on the educational issue. Uh, I guess I'll speak on behalf of uh, the registered and the CALS. Uh, and I hope long-term as this program develops, I hope some real traction and looks like ultimately it will be successful and being approved. Um, uh, you know, as an example of my, my enrollment, we have a number of paralegals coming out of Cerritos College, which is 
walking distance from our campus when we were on campus. And the idea that we can admit um, those graduates of a, co a community college with an AA degree and have and will continue to do so uh, with this program in mind and, and have a two track kind of JD program, um, you know, I think that would dovetail nicely with the, the goals of the paraprofessional program and really long term. And, and now I'm on the soapbox to say that if you're looking at legislative ways to implement this uh, is to get an exemption from the first year exam. Uh, for registered uh, Cal uh, accredited schools to allow uh, individuals with an interest in becoming a paraprofessional to graduate with a JD and not be, you know, uh, have the uh, uh, requirement of the first year ahead of them. So, I mean, I think long term, as another example of, of what the service that the CALs and the registered schools do for all the, you know, expressed goals of the state bar. Uh, and this being one of the most important, the justice cap, it would, I think, work beautifully long term and, and perhaps would uh, you know, be, be well, well, well received. The second point I have to make, and I can't resist as an old antitrust lawyer, uh, is you know, this classic guild mentality that I think many, many members of the state bar have. And um, I think to echo Dean Frickberg's comments, um, the first obvious market impact is lawyers aren't doing this work. If they were and were willing to work at the rates that a paraprofessional might, um, then they might have an argument. Um, and the second point is, and this is the point that has been demonstrated historically in many other industries, is uh, I, think, I think a membership will be surprised at the amount of legal work that paraprofessionals will generate for licensed attorneys. Uh, because when individuals uh, of any eco economic uh, you know, stratum start talking about issues, uh, cases, claims, you know, suddenly become relevant or understandable. And suddenly the paraprofessional will say, well, I, I don't do that. I can't do that. But, you know, my partner here does or the attorney I work with does. So uh, I think in the long term, if this ever really gets going, uh, I think just the opposite would be true. This would actually uh, benefit uh, the membership far more than uh, it would serve to detriment. So uh, that hopefully is a point that can be made whenever you're uh, arguing or advocating this uh, to, uh, to any organized bar association or any individual member. So uh, again, good luck and, and thanks for all the hard work that uh, has already been put in. Thank you. And I wanna again, thank Ira because Ira did participate and, and there were so, uh, uh, that's one thing I didn't mention during the presentation. We had the full working group met 20 times and then the sub, committees met 143 times. This was over the course of 17 months. This is a very, very hardworking um, committee that produced a very thorough set of recommendations, like a program that's ready to implement. So I really uh, appreciate our volunteers. May I, <laughs> may I, ask, one last, <laughs> may I ask one last question? Um, sure. Just, uh, have you uh, been in touch with any of the major malpractice carriers for lawyers and Got any read from them how they would uh, underwrite the, the insurance for the uh, law firms that employ paraprofessionals? Not that to that question specifically, no. Well, th there was a, we didn't contact the carriers, but one of the members of the uh, working group is a lawyer who uh, uh, paraprofessionals, Takes, does cases with lawyers mutual and others and other uh, legal malpractice carriers defends their cases and, and knows a lot about that business. And I remember, I'm almost certain I'm remembering this right, that he thought that there would be uh, no affordable market for malpractice insurance uh, 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 because of the lack of uh, uh, claims history, they, they have no way to price their um, the, the premium except real high. <laughs> uh, that he may be wrong, but he's pretty knowledgeable in, in, in this field. That 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 could pose a very significant problem, at least with professionals working in law firms and law firms anyway. Yeah, so that's why the the, the surety bond uh, yeah. alternative is, is is a good one and maybe better. Any other questions? 
Well, I want to thank you for inviting me and allowing me the opportunity to present the program and again encourage everyone to submit your comments um, because we are compiling them and that we're getting some very interesting comments on the program on the recommendations. Nice seeing you folks again. Thank you. Uh, Linda and Ira both, I'd like to thank you both not only for your presentation today, but for engaging the law schools uh, throughout the process. And a thank you to the law schools that have been providing that comment. And if you, if your school is interested in providing additional comment, just as when you comment on the rules, uh, the State Bar's public comment page contains these recommendations uh, where you can file your further uh, public comment through January 12th. Uh, so I appreciate this continuous uh, involvement. Thank you. Okay, bye. I think we are going to move forward with the agenda onto our recent developments uh, section. Uh, bar staff has asked me to read some information about the Office of Access and Inclusion. They completed a law school survey last year focused on topics related to recruitment, retention, and attrition. Law schools were invited to participate to fo in fo follow up focus groups based on the findings. That's a very alliterative sentence. These were previously announced at prior CS bars and law school council meetings, as well as the law school assembly. A number of law schools have already volunteered, but there's still time for law schools to participate. The Office of Access and Inclusion will be holding its first focus group session next Thursday, uh, not next Thursday, coming up soon, December 16th from 11 to uh, 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Topic plan are the focus group are academic support and non-academic support. The state bar will also hold additional focus groups in January with topics to be announced closer to those dates. If you're interested in participating on the December 16th or uh, later in the new year, please contact law school regulation at calbar.ca.gov. And the bar looks forward to participation and feedback. And with that, I'll hand it off to uh, bar staff to continue with other recent developments. Sure, thank you, Devin. Uh, just quickly, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, thank you to the, uh, the accredited and registered schools that submitted their annual reports uh, in November. Uh, we are following up and processing those now. Uh, same to the schools that have been um, proceeding under the uh, general waiver from the committee uh, regarding the COVID pandemic circumstances. Uh, we had 100% on time uh, report. Um, report a percentage, so that was terrific. Uh, for those uh, graduates from your schools that are participating in the Bar Strategies and Stories program as they prepare to take the February 2022 exam, if they have already registered uh, this week, they received the program. And uh, we would encourage you to encourage them to take that program right away. Uh, it's a very brief program, uh, under an hour. Uh, sometimes once they've got it on their desk and they're studying, uh, they might delay, but it really puts them in a great mi uh, mindset to begin that study and they'll get the most value if they do it immediately. If you have any students, I'm sorry, graduates who haven't yet signed up but want to, they can do so until January 7th using the personal email links uh, that the State Bar sends to them. And uh, we encourage that based on the very promising results that all of you saw at the law school assembly. Uh, similarly, the Blue Ribbon Commission um, on the future of the bar exam is uh, meeting next week. Many of you have signed up for the alerts uh, that you can get on our State Bar Committee page when those meetings happen so that you can watch the live meetings uh, or review the webcasts. Um, also referring back to something that Audrey said uh, regarding e-blasts for deans as the February 2022 bar exam is approaching. In the six weeks prior, every Friday, Audrey sends an update and more often if necessary to all of the California law school deans. And if you have other staff or there uh, would be staff out um, in the audience watching today that would like to be part of that e-blast, uh, they can mail the law school regulation box law school regulation at calbar.ca.gov and uh, we will add any of your uh, bar support staff or other staff that could benefit uh, from that information. Uh, so those are just a couple of quick announcements. Happy to take any questions and if not, we can proceed on to the goals discussion. Okay. 
Okay, thanks everyone. And now on to our, our final agenda item, uh, feedback on the Committee of Bar Examiner's list of educational standard goals. Hopefully everyone's had an opportunity to review that. If not, it is posted uh, for the upcoming Friday committee meeting. Again, this should set the frames for discussion. Educational standard goals primarily affect our registered and accredited CalBARS schools. Um, it also aims and related topics for the committee consideration can be discussed. Uh, this is still time, if you would like, uh, for public comment this Friday when the committee meets, especially I know I've heard some concerns and thoughts on the first year law students exam, as was raised in our meeting today, as well as our registered guideline 1.11 concerning bar prep. So the, there'll be an opportune time, I think, to raise those discussions again. And unless there's further discussion, I'll turn it over back to Ms. Leonard. If there's anything else that we need to touch on on that item. Um, no further, Chair Frickberg. Uh, Dean Keller? Yeah, sorry, I guess I didn't raise my hand quickly enough. Sorry, on the, uh, the, uh, the goals. I just had a quick question on the goals for Sanders. Um, I'm curious what the goal is um, related to a potential June presentation with a national or regional institutional accreditor. Sure. Uh, so each year uh, we try to have several training opportunities uh, or update opportunities for the Committee of Bar Examiners. And this year with the rollout of um, the jointly accredited status in 2022, uh, it's an opportunity for the Committee of Bar Examiners uh, to hear directly from some of those uh, institutional accreditors, whether they be regional or national. Uh, you might recall uh, back in 2019, uh, a member, actually two members from WASC attended a CPE meeting, and we might be looking to others uh, who might attend in June to have direct conversation with CBE to increase the uh, smooth partnership. Okay, thanks. And unless there's any other questions, uh, I think we could entertain a motion to adjourn as we are two minutes out from our Scheduled close time. So moved. I don't know if you and I could do the same moves or not. We're so going. Moved. Second. We don't Any need vote? a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Thought it couldn't hurt. Okay. <laughs> Well, appreciate everyone uh, joining us together in this joint CS bars and law school council meeting uh, with so many topics of common interest at this time of year and uh, wishing everyone a safe and happy holiday as we proceed and plan to meet again in the new year. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see everyone. Thank you, Thank you everyone. And welcome to the new members. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.